We begin today with the most significant challenge to reproductive rights since Roe v. Wade became law in 1973. The Supreme Court could soon decide to significantly curtail reproductive rights or, or outright overturn Roe v. Wade. Let's get into this now with the co-dean at Rutgers Law. Her focus is on reproductive justice, bioethics, and family health law. Good to welcome back Kimberly Murchison. Dean, good to see you again. You too. Thanks so much for having me. So was I correct in my intro there that it would uh, these decisions could significantly curtail reproductive rights or overturn Roe v. Wade completely? Is that Absolutely. What's that at is stake? exactly where we are. Um, and as you say, right, that is very significant. We have had a few cases in the last few years that have gone up to the court um, where they have reinforced Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey, which is the 1992 case. Um, and yet here we are once again up at the Supreme Court and the oral argument that we heard uh, the other week suggests that the majority of the justices are prepared to, if not completely overrule Roe, um, to roll it back substantially. So all right, what you're referencing is uh, arguments before the court uh, on this case in Mississippi. It's a challenge to a law there. Can you walk us through what that Mississippi law is trying to do? Yeah, so the law in Mississippi is a 15 week ban. Um, and basically where we have been in the United States since 1992 in Planned Parenthood versus Casey um, is that states cannot ban abortion um, before viability. So 15 weeks is very clearly before viability. So under existing Supreme Court precedent, it is unconstitutional. The only way for that law to stand is for the court to decide that Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey didn't mean what they said. So did you hear that? Or uh, when you listened to the arguments or more importantly, when, when the, the uh, justices comment so, I mean, I think we all who do this kind of work went into the argument expecting that it would be difficult to hear that really the only justices who would make any sort of um, full throated de defense of Casey and Roe um, were Justice Sotomayor, Justice Kagan and Justice Breyer. Um, so the other six justices uh, sort of did exactly what I expected and what lots of other folks, folks expected, which is let's figure out how to poke holes, either to decide, as you know, Justice Thomas would have done many years ago, um, that Roe versus Wade should be overturned because the word abortion doesn't exist um, in the Constitution. That could also be said of privacy, of marriage, of parenthood, right? None of those appear in the, in the Constitution either. Um, or uh, Justice Barrett, who had a really um, problematic, I would say, argument that, you know, pregnancy isn't really a burden because you can just give birth to a baby and then put the baby up for adoption. And, you know, there were a lot of things that were said during that argument that really reflected very poorly on how the justices think about women, how the justices think about equality, um, and how the justices think about bodily integrity. So the court is also deliberating on this Texas abortion law yeah. also, right? I mean, the yes. arguments there are different, are they both equally uh, significant in terms of potential impact? Well, Dobbs versus Mississippi is the case that they've already heard on the merits. So the SB8 case, the case from Texas, all of the issues that have been up to the Supreme Court so far are just procedural issues. There hasn't actually been sort of a trial to work out right. the facts and all of those good things. Whereas Dobbs was heard um, in oral argument because all the briefing has been done, um, the, the attorneys on all sides have been able to make their arguments in front of the court, and we should expect a decision from them probably in June. So what happens if Roe v. Wade is overturned? What are the, what are the practical implications on women who may be seeking access to abortion services? So what happens if Roe gets overturned is that the court basically says there is no longer a federal constitutional right to terminate a pregnancy. That doesn't make abortion illegal in the United States. What it does do is it sends it back to all 50 states to make their own decisions about whether abortion is going to be legal and accessible in their jurisdictions. Now, there are already many states that have what are called trigger bans. And trigger bans are basically laws that will immediately go into effect if Roe is overturned and will make abortion illegal 
in those jurisdictions. You have other states that will take this as an opportunity to significantly regulate access to abortion. And then you have other states, New Jersey almost certainly being one of them, that will continue to make abortion um, um, at least legal in the jurisdiction, if not always accessible. Meaning the real possibility of women having to leave their state to go to another state uh, to, to get abortion services. You said um, New Jersey would probably be one that would uphold uh, the right. Um, access to abortion pretty widely available, although not necessarily equally around yes. the state, but available. Uh, right. You said a couple of weeks ago, the court that decides that a right exists can decide that a right doesn't exist any longer. You were talking about the Supreme Court, but it was an example of the way that rights become rights, right? Now mm -hmm. in New Jersey, we've been talking about the Reproductive Freedom Act, which would codify a woman's right to access abortion services. Mm -hmm. What does that mean and, and why is it significant? So there are two things that are really significant about the Reproductive Freedom Act that's been floating around in New Jersey for, for quite some time now and yet has not come to a vote, um, although it's clear that Governor Murphy would sign it if it did get passed. Um, so it does two things. So one is that it codifies the right to abortion um, in New Jersey. So it says this isn't just something that a judge said is useful and important. It is part of our law um, here in New Jersey. So that's one thing that's important. Um, but the second thing is, what's the, what's the point of having a right if you can't actually access it? So the second thing that the Reproductive Freedom Act does that is so important is it expands the kinds of financial resources that people have access to if they want to terminate a pregnancy. Um, so whether it's insurance or Medicaid, um, you know, really making it a right that people can effectuate, right, which, which requires finances. The other thing that has happened um, in New Jersey, and this actually just happened in the past week, um, and this was um, a decision that was made by the State Board of Medical Examiners, but also something that was uh, part of the Reproductive Freedom Act, is expanding the medical providers who can do abortion care. So if you limit it to just physicians, which is completely medically unnecessary. But if you limit it to just physicians, then there are fewer people that folks can go to when they want to have an abortion. But now in New Jersey, advanced practice nurses, certified nurse midwives, physicians assistants, um, people who are completely capable and have sufficient training to perform abortions will be able to do that. And that is also incredibly important for expanding access. All right, 2022 proving to be a critical year. Professor and co-dean at Rutgers Law, Kimberly Marcherson. Good to see you, and thanks for coming on with us today, and have a great holiday. Absolutely. You do the same.